here last week. That's right. The same people. That's our woo section right there. I, I like that. I love it. That, that's beautiful. Hey, if you've got your Bibles, would you grab them? Go ahead and turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, verse 18. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. So if you'll stop by the connection area right at the back before you leave, we'll, we'll give you one. You can also follow along at bridgepoint.cc forward slash live if you have a smartphone or a tablet. Um, or you can look at the screen. Um, whatever way you need to do it, I want you to be able to engage with the Bible because at Bridgepoint, we, we love Scripture. We, we believe God speaks to us through His Scripture. We believe it's His Word. And so uh, we want to give priority to it today. Um, if, you're, if you're taking notes, and I hope that you will, uh, write down tolerant in Thyatira. Thyatira. Now, I want everybody, I want you to look at somebody beside you and say, uh, I want you to just say Thyatira. Just Okay, now, do you think, anybody, if you think you can say it three times fast, you could try that. You're going to sound real strange. There you go. I love this. Y'all are participating. This is good. This is a, a community experience right now. Uh, and so I love, I love that. And just like you're engaging, I hope you'll engage as we, uh, as we jump in to God's Word. Today, we're going to talk about a church that uh, was known for being tolerant, a church that was known for being tolerant. Tolerant. Now, um, I don't know about you, but in our culture, tolerance is is like a key value. Wouldn't you say that? I'd say in our culture that if you wanted to put top values of what we right here in America, people say, okay, I, I, we want you to be tolerant. And about the only thing that you know our society is intolerant of is when people are not tolerant. Okay, And so um, we live in a place in which in our minds we think tolerance and we think good. But what we're going to see today is tolerance is not always a good thing. And for this church, it was not only not a good thing, it was a destructive thing that had led to damage for this church and for the cause of Christ. And so today we're going to talk about um, how God views his church when they are overly tolerant or even more tolerant than, than he is. Now, in case you haven't been here for this series, let me give you a little background. That We're talking about seven letters that were written to seven historic churches. They, there was a guy named John who had been on exile in, a, in the island called Patmos, and Jesus Christ shows up in, in a vision and tells him, I want you to write these things down. I want you to send them to, to these seven churches. And Jesus, who is, is Lord of the churches, Jesus is the one that we come to celebrate. Jesus is the one that, that died and rose again so that he could form the church. And the church is simply a body of believers, a body of people that have faith in Jesus. And, and he says, I want you to send these messages to these seven churches. But you'll notice that, that we're ta- we titled this sermon series, Urgent Messages to the Modern Church. Because this is what we believe. We believe the messages that we're covering not only spoke back then, but they speak to us today. That's part of the significance of seven. Seven's the number of completion. And so these, these messages in this way are, are timeless. They go beyond the original circumstances and they speak to us today. And I believe that God's going to speak to us today um, as, we, as we look at this fourth church, as we look at this fourth church. So I want to pray for us. Hopefully you've made it to uh, Revelation chapter 2 um, and verse 18. So let's pray. Father, we pray right now that as we study your word, as we encounter it, that you will shape us, you will change us, that you will speak to us. I pray that the blessing that's pronounced at the beginning of this book, that those that, that read it, those that, that hear it, and those that obey it, that there is a blessing. God, I pray that today. I pray that each and every person here will, will be a participant in the blessing that you promise to those who listen and obey your word, who are not just hearers of the word, but also doers. So, so change us, enable us to do that. Give us, give us ears to hear exactly what you want us to, to hear today from you. We believe you are going to speak to us. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, um, if you're taking notes, we're going to begin with, number one, Christ, okay? That, that every letter that we've looked at, it begins with the description of Jesus and a, and a command of Jesus to, to write to the churches. So, this is what he says in verse 18, write to the angel of the church 
in Thyatira. Now, the angel um, is the, there's a spiritual, uh, spiritual entity. It's called an angel. They're real. That's not a fantasy. That's a real thing. They're servants of God. They were created by God to bring him, him glory. But also what they do is they're servants. And he says, so the angel of, of this church in Thyatira, I want you to, to write this message. This is what Jesus' command is. Now, Thyatira, uh, we, we really don't know how the church was formed. But if you look back in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16, um, Paul and all of his companions, Paul was a missionary and, and going and sharing the good news of Jesus. Well, he ends up in Macedonia, and there's actually a lady there who is from Thyatira, and, and her name is Lydia. Lydia is a seller of purple, and and, and she has an encounter in which she comes to become a follower of Jesus, not only her, but her entire household. And so, I, you know, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to think that, that this, this lady, Lydia, that when she went back to her home, that she began to share the gospel, because that's what you do when you're a believer, isn't it? You share the good news of Jesus with other people. And so I believe Lydia was one of the people that laid a foundation for this. And also, we know that Paul was ministering in, in the area of Ephesus for a number of years. And, and we're told that, that the message began to spread out from there. And that's where the area of these churches are, is right in Asia Minor. And, and we started with Ephesus, and, and we're traveling around. We made it to Thyatira. And so there's a church that's formed here. Y'all know every church is formed the same way. Now, I mean, the circumstances might be a little bit different, but this is how a church begins. People hear the gospel of Jesus. They hear that we're sinners and we're far from God, and, and then they respond in faith, and then they go public with their faith through baptism, and then those believers begin to gather together and worship. That's how all churches form. That, that's how we got here. The same way, people come to know Jesus, and one by one, the church continues to grow, and so this has happened in this city called Thyatira. And so, um, Jesus, what, do, what does this tell us about Christ? Back in chapter one, we're given a big picture description of who Jesus is, but at the beginning of each letter, um, there, there's a focus on Jesus. He describes himself in a way that's gonna be particularly meaningful to each of these churches. So let's look and see what Jesus says to, to this particular church. So he says, write to the angel of the church in Thyatira, the son of God, the son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze says. Now, what's interesting about this is if you rewind back to chapter one, Jesus, when he described himself, we see the same language of uh, eyes like a fiery flame and feet like fine bronze, but there's been a change. In chapter one, Jesus says the son of man, but here he describes himself as the son of God. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, oh, why is that happening? Why, did, why the switch? Why is every other description the same? Well, partly understanding this city will help you to understand why Jesus refers to himself as the son of God in this instance. The, number, the God that was worshiped most, uh, most prominently right here in Thyatira was a, the, a God, a false God by the name of Apollos. And if you know anything about some of the, these gods and goddesses, he was the son of Zeus. And Zeus was supposedly the, the main God. And so Jesus to this city that, that often worshiped this one that was the son of the God Zeus, Jesus stands up and says, no, the real son of God is here. The real son of God is right here in your city to speak to you. And what an encouragement, because when we're dealing with Jesus, we're not just simply dealing with, with someone that is merely a man. Jesus is fully Human. He was fully a man. He experienced the things that we experienced. He, he was born uh, of a virgin, but he, he lived that life without sin. But we're also told that he's a son of God. He is not only man, but he's God. Jesus is the only one that has brought these two things together. So when we're dealing with Jesus, when this church is dealing with Jesus, we're not just dealing with any old person. We're dealing with the God of the universe, and so the God of the universe says, the son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame. He has these penetrating eyes that he can look inside of, of the church. And he looks at this church and he says, I know everything about you. There's nothing hidden, hidden from me. And the same thing that's true to the church is true for each of us. 
And so Jesus looks and he evaluates. And also it says that he has, has feet like fine bronze. Again, this is one more thing about this city. The city often had these guilds. And the guilds would kind of be like a union. It was, it was where the center of life. And one of the primary guilds, one of the things that they had learned and discovered is they made a fine bronze. It was a stronger bronze than the others. And so Jesus to this church says, the ones with bronze feet, the one, the one that is settled, the one that is secure and is looking over you, I have a message for you. That's a really powerful image, isn't it? You know, we always need to begin with Jesus. It's always about Jesus. It always, it always will be. It always has been. And so for this church, the very first thing that needs to happen, and I believe the same thing that's true for us, is we need to set our eyes on Jesus. We need to, say, we need to realize who this message is coming from. It's coming from, from the God of this world, the one that created all things, the very Son of God, the one that can penetrate and see us, the one that is secure and steady and strong, and now he's got a message to us. So, so that, that's Christ. That's where we begin. And now Christ is going to say something. He's going to give a, a commendation to this church. He's going to tell them about something, something good about them. And, they, and, and let's be honest, they actually have a lot of things that, that are noteworthy, that are incredible about them. And so as we read this, um, if you're a follower of Christ, as, as us as a church, we should take note of that. We should say we want this to be a part of our church. We want this to be a part of our lives. So let's see what his commendation is today. He says, I know your works. I know them. I know them fully. I know them uh, without error. I know everything about you. He says, I know your works. And now he's going to give four things. He says, I know your love. I know your faithfulness. I know your service. And I know your endurance. And your last works are greater than the first. I mean, that, that, that's pretty awesome. He says, you know, when you first got started, you know, things are starting off a little bit slow, but as you progressed on, you have increased in all of these areas. Your love has increased. Your faith has increased. Your service has increased. Your endurance has increased. And, and, and you're better off now than you used to be. Well, what's interesting is this is actually the opposite of what had happened in the city of Ephesus, isn't it? He had actually told them, he said, You've lost your first love, and, and you need to go back to where you started. Now, this church, he's like, no, 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 you don't need to go back where you started. You've done some good things. So look at these. Every church should be characterized by love. Isn't that true? I mean, our, our God is a God of love. He, he's a God that loved us so much that he sent his son. And, and we are to be known not only by our love for God, but our love for, uh, for one another and our love for people that are far from God. And so he, he looks at this church and he says, you've got love. You've got that going on. And that is so significant because people are going to know us by our love. A church that doesn't have love, a church that is, is known for, for division and fighting, a church that's lost its love for, for God and one another it is a church that's struggling. But he says, hey, this is a strength for you. You're doing good. You, you've got love. So let that characterize you. Number, number two, he says, you, you've got faithfulness or faith. You're, you're enduring. You're holding on to Jesus. You're holding on to the things that you believed. And in the book of Revelation, the idea of enduring is such a, it's a strong theme. And he looks, he says, hey, you're holding on. You're, you're getting better. You're, you're enduring. You're growing. No matter what trials have come your way, you're continuing to grow through those things and your faith in Jesus uh, is increasing. We just sang a song that says, give me faith. Hey, if you are a believer in Jesus, it's true that God's already given you a measure of faith, isn't it? I mean, because we're saved by grace through what? Faith. And so all of us have a measure of faith, but this church had increased in its faith. Don't you want that to be true about our church? The guy would say, I, I, I'm believing you for bigger things. I'm believing you for greater things. God, I'm holding on to my faith. Um, I, I love in Ephesians 3.20 where it says, Now to him who is able to do far more above and beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. The only reason you're going to believe that God will do things above and beyond in our church, above and beyond in your life, above and beyond in and through you is because of faith. And so he looks at his church and and they were a faithful church. They were a loving church. They were a faithful church. Third, he says that your service. This is a, a word that would be deaconing. You're, you're serving one another. This is the church that when they saw needs with one another, they were meeting those needs. 
They saw their brothers and sisters, and they were willing to, to give up things that they had in order to serve other people. This is a church that says, hey, we look around our community, and we see that said, said they need a diaper ministry, and so we're going to start up a diaper ministry. Amen? That was a little plug for us right here. Because I think that's awesome. I do. I, th- I think that service, you know, and, and I'll say this, I, I'll just, uh, for our church, I see our church here. I believe we're a service church that we, we look and want to see needs and we want to see it around our community. And, and we want to see that continue to increase. That's what was happening here. This is the church that was active within the community around it. And they were serving one another. And then last, he says, your endurance. Endurance is the idea of keep going. Everybody, the Christian life is not a sprint. It is a marathon, right? And, and so often what can happen is people will start out strong, start out strong. A church can start out with the right things, but then as time goes on, they start to lose track. But he says, you're enduring. So that's a pretty good list, isn't it? I mean, I love that. I love that Jesus says, hey, I've got a message for you, and I'm going to start by giving you some encouragement. I think this is a great thing to do. Uh, take, take a cue from Jesus is, is let's speak life into one another. And we see one another with these things that are commendable. Let's speak them to one another. I think too often we think those things, but we don't say them. Isn't that true? So when you look around and you see other people right here in this body and you see ways that they're excelling in Christ, instead of first beginning to say, okay, here's what you're not doing, let's say what you are doing. Let's encourage one another. And so uh, Jesus commends this church. But now we're going to see that there's, there's a turn. He said, I know your works. Things are better off now than they used to be. But now we're going to see that Jesus has a confrontation with this church. And before I've used the word criticism, I said it's a criticism. But this time, this is a confrontation because I feel like this is the strongest rebuke that's come to the churches so far. And we're going to see for all of the good things that they have going on, there's some things that they have going on in their church that are disastrous. It's unhealthy. And I think this is true. We often think of our lives and we think of our church, we think of a balance. We think, okay, well, man, look at all this good that's happening over here. Well, you know, the good, you know, I've got a couple of things that aren't so good, but look at all the good, right? But Jesus says, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to acknowledge both of them. I'm going to commend you for the things that are happening within your life that, that are good within the life of your church, but we're also going to deal with the things that need to be confronted. And so... Let, let's read, what, what is Jesus, what's his confrontation that comes against this church? But I have this against you. I have this against you. This is divine displeasure. This, this is our, our Lord and Savior looking at, at his church and he's saying, there's something that, that's not in line There's something that does not bring me pleasure when I look down upon upon your church. And what is that? He says, you, everybody say the word, tolerate. Wait. So Jesus is about to tell us that tolerance isn't a good thing here. Contrary to our culture, he says, the the problem with your church is, is you tolerate. And in particular, what you tolerate. He says, you tolerate... The woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and teaches and deceives my slaves to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrifice to idols. He said, I've got this against you. You, you tolerate. If you, you know, I don't know some of y'all that, that, that tweet, I, I like little one-liners sometimes. And, and this, as I was thinking about this message, uh, the thing that came to my mind is this. It says, We can never be more tolerant than Jesus. We should never be more tolerant than Jesus. And our culture says we need to tolerate everything. But what I want you to notice is this is less about the culture. This is not Jesus looking out into the world and and seeing all the problems that are there. You know, here's the truth. I look out into the world and I see people that that follow other religions. I see people that say, hey, you know, I'm a Muslim and I believe Allah is God and I believe they're dead wrong. Okay, I believe that's 100% wrong. I believe that unless there's a change that they're on a path to destruction. 
I believe the same thing about Mormonism because Mormonism denies Jesus and who he truly is. So I can go on and on about all these different religions. Now here's what, here's what I believe. I tolerate that in the sense that I'm not going to come up to them with a gun to their head and say, unless you believe with Jesus, I'm taking you out. Because that is not the way that the gospel goes forward. Can I tell you, it never works well when that's the way that, that people approach it. Uh, I got to believe in Jesus or you're going to shoot me? Yeah, I believe. Amen. Sign me up. That's what's going to happen, right? If you look back even in, in, in church history when Constantine, you know, declared that Christianity was going to be the, the religion of the wrong, you know what happened? I actually think that was one of the worst things that happened in many ways because then everybody was a Christian, right? So is there a sense in which we need to tolerate people that we have to live with people that we differ with? Yes. I'll tell you, I look out in our, our culture right now, and, and I see people, and, and, and our, the big thing in our culture is, is homosexuality, and our culture is screaming, you need to accept this, this is good, this is right. Now, you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a little story. I ha had a friend that was you know, one of my best friends all through high school. We even went to college together. We were hanging out with my family, and one day he came up to me, he said, hey, Eric, he says, I'm gay. We went to church together. We did all that. And I mean, it was just, it was like a shock. He said, hey, Eric, I just need to tell you. He said, I'm, I'm gay. And he said, and you know what? I don't really think that scripture is against that. I feel like that's an okay thing. And, and this is what I told him, okay? And I want to show you, this is how tolerance and intolerance goes together. I looked at him and I said, I said, hey, I just need to say something to you. You're my friend no matter what. I love you. Uh, we're, you and I are going to be friends. And even after this conversation is over, um, you're still going to be the guy that I grew up with. And that's not changing. But you need to know that Scripture's not on your side with this one. And so we had this conversation. It was, it was really hard. And at the end of it, and we, we ended up talking about you know, what it means to be a Christian and he said well if that's really what it means to be a Christian I think you're right uh, I, you know I was wrong you're, you're right scriptures against that um, I guess I shouldn't ever call myself a Christian it's the most horrible you know ending to where that conversation and things continue on to that day we're still friends tolerance but intolerance y'all see that together and so he looked at this church and said this is not about us being jerks I mean, there's no excuse for that within our culture. And often we're really good at casting stones of people outside the church. But who is Jesus dealing with right now? He's dealing with his church. He's looking inside his church. So I'll, I'll just say this. I know everybody likes to get on Facebook and blast everybody. How about we just take a little time off Facebook and we look at our own, our own selves and our own church and our own lives. How about that? Yeah, I'm preaching today. That's, that's happening. <laughs> In case you didn't know, you know, we, we just got to take the gloves off, right? We can't be a fake place. Let's talk about the stuff that actually matters to us, all right? So he says, you tolerate the woman Jezebel. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. I want to say something about Jezebel. Uh, if you remember the last letter, he had told that they were following Balaam. But, but Balaam, it was, he, they were using his name as, as a type. Balaam was an Old Testament, really a false prophet that, that um, was paid by a king in order to tempt the people of God and, and to fall into sin. In the same way, Jezebel is an Old Testament lady. She, she married the king Ahab, and, uh, and between them together, they led Israel astray. They, they caused them to worship in ways they never should have worshipped. So those of you that are pregnant right now and you found out that you're going to be having a girl, Jezebel is not the name you want to do. I'm just going to let you in on it. If you come up and say, hey, Pastor Eric, in honor of the sermon that you did in the seven series, I named my daughter Jezebel, I'm going to know you didn't listen, okay? <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to be like, I'm going to pray for you, okay? <laughs> and pray, pray for them, you know, that if you want to curse your kid forever, name them Jezebel, okay? So this woman, Jezebel, so uh, there really is a, a lady within this church, but they're using the, the name Jezebel. I don't believe that was really her name to, to show what she was doing, to point to the type of action she was doing. No, uh, notice what he says about Jezebel. She calls herself 
a prophetess. Now, this is one of the biggest problems. A big problem is when we call ourselves something that God doesn't say about us. You know, people can say stuff about themselves all the time. She'd be like, I'm a prophetess. And God says, no, no, you're not. But that's what she was claiming. And so she was claiming, we know if you look in, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians, we know that, that people were, they prophesied and, and they would speak truth and, and, and they would speak that. And then the, the elders and the leaders within the church, they would evaluate the things that were said. And so both men and women, they prophesied in the church and it wasn't, on author, it wasn't equal with scripture. It wasn't like the Old Testament where they were like, thus says the Lord. But this lady had taken it upon herself to begin teaching people, it's like, hey, hey, I've got a word from the Lord to you guys. But what she had been saying, her word, it was contrary to Scripture. And can I tell you, anytime somebody says, hey, I've got a word from the Lord and it contradicts Scripture, they're wrong. They're wrong. Now, I believe God speaks through people. I do believe that. I've had people speak things into my life, but you know what? The filter is always this, isn't it? And what had happened is, is she was coming and she was saying that she was a prophetess and she was teaching people and look what had happened. And what had happened is, and she deceives my slaves. Now I want you to know something. This is the only time in the book of Revelation where it says that believers are the ones that are deceived. Every other time, it's people that are far from God that are deceived. And also, get this, I'll tell you the crew that she's hanging with, because the book of Revelation talks about a lot of people deceiving. You know who one of them is? Satan. Satan is said to deceive people. You know who else? The false prophet. And also, the harlot Babylon. Those are, those are three other people in the book of Revelation that are said to deceive people. So i got to tell you, she's not in good company. When, you're, when your partner in deception is Satan, that's not good. And so these people, they're, they're, being, they're being deceived, which is the idea of being seduced into sinning, being seduced. And, and you may wonder, is it possible for people that genuinely know Jesus, their hearts have been changed by Jesus, is it possible for them to be deceived and to fall into great sin? And I believe the answer, according to this scripture, is absolutely yes, it is. Sometimes we, you look at people's lives and the pattern of their life, and it could mean that based on their actions, their hearts, they've never been changed from the inside out. They've never truly become believers. But right here, he says, my slaves. And every time, remember, we talked about this. Uh, John refers to himself as a slave. He's writing to my slaves. This is the idea that Christ owns us. We were bought with the price. We used to be slaves to sin, now we're slaves to righteousness. What a horrible thing that those who have been made slaves to righteousness, slaves to Christ, would then be deceived and go back to the old way of life, but it can happen. And I think this is a warning to us. It doesn't matter how long you've walked with Jesus, it is possible for you to fall into deception and to fall into great sin. It can happen. And, and let's look at the particular things that, that she has seduced them to do. She has seduced them to commit sexual immorality. Now, that's a, that's a broad term that includes a whole lot of things. And to eat meat sacrifice to idols. Now, so these two things, sexual immorality, meat sacrifice to idols. If you want to look back at Acts chapter 15, one of the issues, one of the things that had been sent out to all the Gentile churches is they, they gave, gave some regulations to them. They said, hey, you know, don't commit sexual immorality and, and, don't, do, and don't worship uh, the idols and, and participate in these feasts. And then there were two other regulations. You look back at Acts 15, it, it explained that out. But this church had abandoned those practices. And here's probably why. I mentioned to you that there were guilds within this city. Now, this is how the city life worked in Thyatira. You were basically born into a guild. Like, hey, I, I woke up, my dad is a, is a you know, a, a, a bronze smith, a copper smith, and, and guess what? I'm going to take over the family business. It was almost like a little union. And, and then, remember, Lydia, I mentioned earlier, she was a seller of purple. And so there was a textile type of guild. So there was guilds, and, and everything that you did was basically with that guild. It was like your club. It was like flying your colors. 
And so uh, one of the things, though, one of the things that it meant to participate in these guilds is each guild had its own little idol, its own little God. And part of what they would do is they would make sacrifices to this God. Can you see where the issue might start coming for the believers? Okay, I've come to know Jesus, and this is my family business, and now I'm being tempted to, to make sacrifices to this idol, and I know that I'm only supposed to worship Jesus, uh, so what am I supposed to do? If I, if I turn away from this, I'm gonna lose my, I could lose my job. I'm going to lose all my social standing. So this is a real temptation. Whereas in some of the other churches, they were being tempted and, uh, and being persecuted from the outside. This temptation is coming from within their, their culture. It's a, a social persecution. So you can imagine someone like Jezebel that comes around and she says, you know, it's really not that big of a deal. You don't want to lose your job, do you? I mean, you can, you can worship Jesus and participate in these, in these idol feasts. You can worship Jesus and commit sexual immorality. That's not that big a deal. And this teaching from her had taken root within this church so that they tolerate it. They participate in it. Nobody stands up against it. And the church has been led astray here. Now, you wonder, why would people tolerate something like this? It's very simple. Because anybody that teaches that we can have one foot in the world and one foot within the church... That's going to be appealing to many people, right? I can have Jesus... And I can have sex with the person I'm not married with. I can have Jesus, and I can have this inappropriate relationship. I can have Jesus, and I can have my pornography. I can have Jesus, and I can have my drugs. I can have Jesus, I can have my drunkenness. I can have, my G- I can have Jesus, and I can have whatever was in your old way of life. I, you can have both of them. That's really what she was teaching. That's not that big of a deal. But here's the bottom line with it. You can't have Jesus and your old way of life. You can't have Jesus in your old way of life. You can't keep one foot in the world and one foot with Jesus. It just doesn't work that way. Jesus says, I bought you with a price. I want all of you. I I want every part of you. That's right. Amen. Clap your hands. That's good. And so this church had, these people had been deceived. Now I want you to notice something. I I want you to see that Jesus now speaks to the consequences of, that are coming because they've taken this action. You know, if the last church we talked about was in compromise, these people have taken compromise to a whole new level. It so pervades the church, everything about this church. And so Jesus, he says, here's the consequences that are going to happen. He says, I gave her time to do what? Man, I just want to stop right there. How gracious is God? I, I mean, God, in the moment that he saw this happen, he could have said, boom, you're done. You're out. But how gracious is our God? You know, I think often we see the word repent or the call to repent. We actually view it as a law, as a negative. Can I tell you, when Jesus speaks repent to us, that's one of the most gracious things he could ever do. Because you know what he's saying? He's saying, I love you so much that I'm not going to allow you to continue in the way that you're going. I'm giving you time to make a change. I'm giving you time to return back to me. And you know, that's ultimately what repentance is. Repentance is, is ultimately turning back to Jesus. It's turning back to his grace because we were saved by what? By grace through faith. And so he says, I gave her time to repent. And you know what the, the news was? When, how, how did he give her time? I believe he probably sent some people to her to correct her, her false teaching. And, and the leaders of this church, if they're doing what they're called to do, then when they saw that she was teaching false things, they would have confronted her. It, it, one of the very first commands that Jesus gives to his church is in Matthew chapter 18. He says, hey, if anybody's caught in sin, uh, you should go to them. 
You should go to them in private. And then if, 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 if they return from their ways, you've won your brother back, that's great. It's awesome. But if they don't, take someone else with you and go to them and talk to them, plead with them, call them to turn back to Christ. And you know what? If they still don't listen to two people, eventually you have to tell it to the church. And if they won't even listen to the church, then eventually that person has to be put out. Why? Not because Jesus is mean, not because the church is mean, but because ultimately a person that shows himself of being unwilling to repent of sin is someone that is demonstrating that their heart really hasn't been changed by Jesus. And so he says, so we're going to put you outside of the church because that's really where you belong. By your actions, you're showing yourself as one that's not a believer. So we're not going to treat you like a believer. And the ultimate hope of doing that is so that people will turn back to Christ. The ultimate hope is so that people will see the error of their ways. And so, you know, church discipline is a real thing and it can get messy and it's not about being mean. And everybody can say, well, that's not very tolerant. Can I tell you, God is gracious. The fact that he says, send this person and then this person, this person, he says, I give you time. And you know what? For some of you, God's been giving you time. There's been something in your life that you know shouldn't be there and God says, I'm giving you time. But here's a warning to us. Eventually, time runs out. He says, I gave her time, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Why would you not want to do that? It's because ultimately sin is pleasurable for a moment. It it feels good. She probably liked the attention of everybody looking to her as she's this, this guru within the church. He says, I gave her time to repent and she did not. And so there's going to be a consequence for her. We actually are going to see that there's consequences not only directed to Jezebel, but to two other groups. So let's look at Jezebel. He says, what, what's the consequence for her? He says, look, I will throw her into a sick bed. It's actually literally, I will throw her into bed, which is an interesting thing. It's, it's like he's saying, hey, if she wants to tell people to commit sexual immorality, if she wants to lay in that bed, I'm going to throw her in a different kind of bed. I'm going to throw her in, in, in a sick bed. I'm, I'm going to throw her, throw her down. Now, you know what's interesting in, is if you look back at 2 Kings 9, which talks about the original Jezebel, she was actually thrown off a wall to her death. And that was God's judgment on her sin. And we often look back and say, well, God, isn't that really harsh? But I want you to see that often the judgments that, that happen in the Old Testament are pointing to the future judgment that happens when people do not turn from sin. And ultimately, judgment happens when we're separated from God and we actually go to a real place called hell there forever. That's the judgment. So all these other judgments we read in Scripture are ultimately to point us to say God is serious about sin. He's serious about his glory. He's serious when he says something. And what had happened for Jezebel is, you know, we do one of two things when we encounter God's word. We either let God's word change us or we seek to change God's word. Did y'all just hear that? I want to say that again. We either, we either let God's word change us, that would be the repentance factor, or we try to change God's word, and that's what she had done. She had said, hey, what God said, that, that's not really it. Isn't that what we've been dealing with from the very beginning? Satan said, did God really say? And absolutely nothing has changed. We still hear voices say, did God really say that? You know, we live, and it's not just the world that's trying to rewrite what God says. It's the church that often begins to start rewriting what God says. The things that God has made very clear, the church that follows the, the pattern of Thyatira, we begin to look at the clear things that God says, and we'd say, well, because our culture is changing, I guess we need to adjust God's word. No, 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 no. God doesn't need to change. We do. And she was not willing to do it. So it says she's going to be thrown onto a sick bed. The next group is she said, I will, uh, he says, I will do this. I will throw those who commit adultery with her 
into great tribulation unless they repent of her practices. Now, it, it could be that they were actually committing sexual immorality with Jezebel, but it's more of the idea of, you know what, you're participating, the things that she's taught, you're choosing to participate. Now, remember, this goes back to it was his slaves, his servants, his believers who had been deceived, right? Now, to Jezebel, she's been said that she's going to be thrown on a sickbed, but what does he say is going to happen to, to those believers that are continuing to practice this? They're going to be thrown into what? Great tribulation. And, and I want you to see this, that God will often bring great tribulation into our lives in order to draw us back. He'll, he'll basically pull back the curtain on our sin, and he'll let us experience the consequences of our sin so that we'll be drawn back back to him. But here's the good news for these believers. And here is maybe the, the good news for some of you that are in here today is he says, unless they repent of their practices, there's still time. You know what? I, I can't give you a timeline of how much longer God will give, give you to repent of the things that are in your life. But can I tell you, today's a good day. This moment's a good day. And I want you to see, ultimately, God is even gracious in allowing us to experience great tribulation because that's ultimately meant to draw us back to Him. He says, unless you repent of her practices. And number three, here's the third group. He says, I will kill her children with the plague. Now, these are not likely her like physical children. These are like her spiritual children. Her teaching has been around for so long that other, her, her spiritual children have risen up and they begin to teach some of the same things within the church. You know, every church ha has the, the pattern of raising up the next generation and we can either raise up the next generation to hold God's word, to love God's word, to proclaim God's word, or we can raise up like Jezebel did, people that want to oppose God's word and ultimately what does it lead to? He says, I will kill her children with the plague. Then notice what happens. All the churches will know that I am the one who does what? Examines the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each of you according to your works. Now in the Old Testament, Yahweh, the Lord, had said in Jeremiah 17, 10, I, Yahweh, examine the mind. I test the heart to give each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. And now Jesus, who is fully God, looks and says, I will give to everybody what they deserve. Now, I want you to notice this. The church is a community. Jesus is writing to the whole church. But every person is personally, individually accountable for God, before God. Each and every person within this church is accountable before God. And he says, um, basically, he says, I will, I'm going to make you an example to all the churches. Sometimes God snuffs out churches. He, he puts churches to an end if they will not obey him. And he does it as an example to other people to say, here's what happens when you compromise. Here's what happens whenever you do not follow God's word. I'll put an end to it. Now, Imagine for yourself that you were a believer within this church and you had actually not participated in these things and you actually had tried to stand against it. The words that have come so far are, are, are harsh and you're thinking, what's for me? Now I want you to notice something. Jesus finishes by giving comfort to those believers who have remained faithful. This is what he says. I say to the rest of you, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, those of you that haven't participated in, in these works of Jezebel, those of you who have not tolerated this, those of you who have stood against it, those of you who, even though it meant persecution for you, within, even though it meant social, uh, social damage, you've stood firm. You haven't participated in the idol worship. You haven't participated in sexual immorality. To those of you who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the deep things of Satan, as they say, I do not put any other burden on you. I do not put any other burden. Now notice he says the deep things of Satan, as they say. Most likely he's making a reference because Jezebel and the other, her children that had risen up to begin teaching these things, they said, oh no, these are the deep things of God. I know on the surface it seems like that sexual immorality is not a good thing. I know on the surface, it seems like that, you know, eating meat and sacrifice to idols, participating in this is not, not a big thing, but I'm going to show you the deep things of God. 
And Jesus looks and says, she's not showing you the deep things of God. She's showing you the deep things of Satan. Just like that there was a, in, in Smyrna, that there was a synagogue and, and they believed that they were worshiping God, but he calls them a synagogue of Satan. So he says, these teachings actually come from Satan himself, who's a liar. The rest of you don't hold this. Those of you who haven't experienced this, those of you who have, have withstood and stood against in, the, in this place, he said, I do not put any other burden on you other than this. Verse 25, hold on to what you have until I come. He basically says, keep doing what you're doing. Keep holding on, keep standing firm, keep believing God's word, keep obeying God's word until I come. Because Jesus was going to come in judgment. And now he gives a promise. I love this. Verse 26. The one who is victorious and keeps my words to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. And, they, and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter and he will shatter them like pottery. He quotes from Psalm 2 right in this moment. And, and what he says is Jesus is the one that's been given victory and authority over all the nations. And to those that overcome, to those that can maintain their faith in Jesus, he says, I'm going to share this authority with you. And my rule is going to be part of your rule. And in some way, the judgment that's going to come through Jesus, believers will participate in that as well. He says, you have withstood, and because you've been victorious, I'm going to share my authority with you. I'm going to give you a place. And then the second thing he tells them, he says, just as I received from my father, verse 28, he says, I will also give him the morning star. So he says, I'm going to give those of you that overcome, I'm going to give you authority. And this is true for every believer. We will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. What an incredible, incredible thing that is, isn't it? But then he, he finishes by saying, and I will give you the morning star. I think this is beautiful. In Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, you, you can write this down, look at it later. Jesus says this. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. You know what this ultimate promise is? That when you overcome, you get the greatest gift that you could ever get. You get Jesus. You get Jesus, not only now, but for all eternity, for those that overcome. You know, that is the best thing about being in heaven. As great as it's going to be for me to see my grandmother, as great as it's going to be to see all the saints in glory, the thing that's going to make heaven so glorious and so great is I get Jesus face to face forever to those that overcome so if you're here today i just want to say a word to you maybe you're like this church and he says repent there's still time that's god's grace to you the fact that he speaks the word repent the fact that you are here that you heard this message he's saying you've got time right now for those of you that are standing firm holding firm to the truth let's cling to the promise today that Jesus is our reward, that Jesus is the one that calls us to be with him, to share in his authority, to sh share in his rule, to share in his reign. Let's pray together. Would you stand to your feet? Lord Jesus, we thank you today for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We pray that, that right now that that people will turn to you. They'll realize that you are the God that died for us and rose again so our sins could be forgiven. God, I pray for those that have never repented of their sins before. I pray that they would do that today. God, for your church, for those that have repented, that have faith in you, God, if they look and see their lives are, are contrary to what you say in your word, I pray they would repent and receive your grace and be right back in receiving your mercy and a right relationship with you. God, to that end, enable us to be obedient to you so that we receive all that you promised to us. We pray this in your name.